Hey, welcome, buddy. Uh, my apologies. I had put out that this would be tomorrow, uh, my date, which would be Wednesday. And unfortunately, we don't live on a flat earth. We do have things called time zones. And I messed up because Dr. Opie lives in Australia and he's a full day in the future. And so it is tomorrow for him. It is Wednesday. It is only Tuesday for me. So we have to reschedule this and doing it tonight. So hopefully the people that were thinking that it was tomorrow can come join us tonight. But with us me tonight, I have Dr. Graham Opie. He is a very prevalent contemporary philosopher. Uh, I believe you're still a uh, professor of philosophy with uh, Mo Monash, Oxford. Yeah, uh, yeah that's right. right, still at Monash, yes. Uh, and and he has graciously came on to donate about an hour of his time to talk about his book, uh, Atheism and Agnosticism, part of the Principles of Religion series. Uh, and one of my arguments that I've had uh, corresponding with Dr. Malik, who wrote a paper on defining atheism and the burden of the proof. Uh, and we're just kind of going to jump into it. I am going to give out the link to, to a few people that want to join. Uh, if they have questions, I will be watching the live chat. Uh, primarily, I'm hoping that I can get some feedback on my own particular argument on, in regards to this. But I also have joining us tonight, uh, Jim Majors, the CEO of Atheist Republic. Hi, Jim. Hi, everyone. And Thanks Milwaukee for having me, Steve. Atheist. Oh, always a pleasure, my friend. And uh, Lawrence from Milwaukee Atheist. Welcome to Hello, Michelle. everyone. Thanks for having me back. So let's jump right into it. Dr. Opie, thank you again so much for donating your time for this. Um, you, you don't know how, like, I'm actually like a little fl flustered um, because I'm always flattered when I have somebody of your prestige and somebody that you're, uh, somebody who's this erudite to come in and actually talk to us. See, I have a fake background because I can't actually read this many books. Well, look at his. That's what somebody who's educated actually has in their background. But anyways, welcome to my channel. I have five. <laughs> you have five. <laughs> It could be worse if the camera was pointing the other way. There's a big stack of books over there that you can't see because this is my. There you go. Office, so there you go. Luckily, this is my bedroom. <laughs> this isn't my office. So, <laughs> well, let's just jump into it. So first, um, do you want to tell people about your 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 book? That by the way, I don't know if it's still available for PDF, but you had it available for PDF. Um, I have it for HDMI and I have it to download. But you want you want to like briefly tell people about that particular book that I referred to. Okay, so Cambridge has a new series called Elements, and this was the first book in their Philosophy of Religion Elements series. And so back in May, when they when it came out, they decided to make it freely available till the end of the year. So you can get the PDF still. Uh, I believe that that will end um, at the end of December. They've since released a bunch of other books like this, and they've also um, they're also free. Um, sorry, what's happened? Everything seems to have frozen. Um, we can still see you. Yeah, yeah it's okay. You. Okay, I can see. I'm just wondering what's happening in front of me on the screen. It's been... Okay, yeah, okay. I, I, I heard a little spike in the audio, but that was about it. Yeah, actually, yeah. I did too. Actually, the audio got really clear and crisp and louder, like about 10 dB gain for some strange reason. But now it's normalized. Yeah. So okay, so 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 the book is meant to be. A very brief introduction to atheism and agnosticism. It starts off by saying how I use the words atheism and agnosticism. And then it says, then there's a little bit about um, how we should assess atheism and agnosticism. And then in the last two chapters of the book, I sketch arguments for atheism and agnosticism. That's, I guess that's what's in it. The whole thing's about 20,000 words. Yeah, that's that's pretty much in a nutshell. I mean, I have it. I actually have it in front of me. And one of the things I do quote often is when you 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 uh, and uh, okay, I, I don't want to get into definitional things because people have this weird conception that I make things definitional arguments. I don't. I personally use specific definitions, usually a sense of strict do definition only because I find that that is what more defines my position, right? What other people use, that's their prerogative. I have never once, contrary to what Matt Dillahunty or anybody else has ever said or thinks, I have never once told an atheist, if you don't subscribe to philosophical terminology, you're not, you're not a true atheist. I've never ever advocated that in the five years I've been on YouTube. That's ridiculous. If somebody holds to a position that they just do not have a belief in God and, and they want to call that atheism in a sensu lato type approach, uh, it is what it is. I mean, that's that, that's a definition. It's a colloquial definition. I, I have arguments why, why I think one definition is better than another, but I don't say that they're not atheists. But my position, Dr. Opie, is that, as you say, you say atheists believe that there are no gods and agnostics suspend judgment on the claim that there are no gods. And that's how I particularly use these definitions for myself. I don't consider myself an atheist because I don't have the belief that there are no gods. I take the position, I do suspend judgment on the proposition. I don't say the proposition is true. I don't say it's false. That is agnostic as defined in, in Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, IEP, 
uh, Cambridge and numerous other sources. So um, first, my question to you is, uh, am I using these terms inappropriately or is there something wrong with my approach by saying that I personally use these terminologies the way you have in your book? I, I, is there anything wrong with that? Uh, so in the in the book, just before I get to saying what um, I mean by the words atheism and, and agnosticism and atheist and agnostic, I point out that it's kind of, it's a stipulation. It's a way of making things precise for a certain purpose. That is so that what I've got to say in the book will be clear. Um, different people use the words differently. The word atheism has a very interesting history and it meant something quite different when it was introduced into the language in the middle of the um, 16th century than what it does now. Um, but there's no, Philosophers do this all the time, take a word that gets used differently by different people in different contexts and give it a precise meaning for their purposes at hand. So no, there's nothing wrong with what you do. You're just following standard practice. And when you say standard practice, my, my argument has always been this, is that um, when you're reading a paper, when you're reading a philosophical paper, I think there's a way that most people come with the approach that these words are going to be used in a specific way on average, right? Obviously there's flu's presumption of atheism. There's uh, Smith who wrote a case against God and uh, Steve Bullivant, who he doesn't necessarily agree either. They're from the Oxford Hamburg of uh, uh, atheism, which is opinion collection of opinion pieces. But overall, if you want to read a paper in context, I have found at according to even Cambridge that it is standard that you ought to use the terminology I use in order to, to understand the papers better. Would that be fair? So it's it's interesting. I and mean, if you go back and you read um, Bertrand Russell, there were times when he said that he was not an atheist. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he said that, he was using the word atheist not in the way that we are using it. He was thinking that in order to be an atheist, you more or less had to be certain that there are no gods. And so when he claimed to be, as he sometimes did, an agnostic, um, he wasn't claiming to be an agnostic in the sense that you claim to be an agnostic, because he was nearly certain that there are no gods, and that would count as atheism, I think, on your view, but not on his. So there's a long history of these words being used differently by different people. And I don't think that there's any, like if you if you go back and you read in the literature, you can't make assumptions about what even quite famous people meant by the word atheist. You have to, you have to look at where they explicitly say what they mean, or you have to read a, a whole lot of context in order to figure out how they're using the word. Yeah, I would say more I'm in modern in modern papers and in, in on average, right? Because you're right I, when he, when Burton Wright wrote uh, you know his thing on am I an atheist or agnostic and things of that nature and and Richard Dawkins uh, he uh, Dawkins also has it he puts certitude for some reason in his Dawkins scale, which I particularly I don't understand that because I subscribe to a weak weak belief condition such that knowledge um, does entail belief, but it doesn't entail certainty. He and also. I, I, yeah, but, uh, he also put a probability in his in his uh, thing, and that really I, threw I, me off because I'm like, I can't assert a probability for that. I can't. I think you can't make a probabilistic argument. I know Doctor Malpass does. He relates things to probability. That I kind of don't have it. I personally don't because I think it's harder to quantify that. But okay, yeah, I, I just don't have never to an atheist, right? That is something sure, sure. That, that I, if somebody wants to stipulate that as a condition, there, uh, that's fine. But I don't stipulate that, right? But my thing, Doctor Opie, is that. Uh, because I don't have that belief, and in generally speaking, in philosophy, atheism is more construed to be the belief that there is no God. Um, you are, am I consistent by claiming that I am agnostic because I am suspending judgment on the particular proposition of theism? So I would have thought. I mean, ag the, the use of the word agnostic is also contested. So mm -hmm. when Huxley in introduced it, he tied it to a claim about knowledge, right? But, he didn't know whether or not there was a God and nobody else could know either or something like that. Whereas I think that the contemporary usage is the one that you've got. If you've suspended judgment about whether there are gods, then that makes you an agnostic. Yeah, and, and Robert Flint in 1903 wrote a bit up on this too. And even he, he claims that when Huxley coined the term that it wasn't so much the case where um, it was about knowledge. It was actually that 
the illusion of knowledge that he the the quote gnostics of his time he felt weren't justified to take either position rather theism or atheism so he wanted to come up with a new term that didn't describe either this is why um when people when people say that you have to be atheist or theist they're using a a schema that i don't use they're using a colloquial schema that you find mostly on youtube and atheist groups but in academics, I don't see that schema. I, I think they rejected uh, Flew's argument for the presumption of atheism back in, I think it was 72. And I don't think it's a good way to define things. But if people wish to, they're, they're, they're perfectly fine to do so. But when they say that it is by necessity that you must be either atheist or a theist, then I take umbrage because it is not by necessity because there are formal definitions that allow for the, quote, middle ground or something between the belief that gods exist and the belief that gods do not exist right and that's what i would place agnosticism or the psychological state of being agnostic on the proposition as this as stanford would actually relate that right so one of the problems here is that uh, i think that there's a symmetry between atheism and theism so the the theist says there's at least one god and denies says it's not the case that there are no gods and that the atheist says there are no gods and deny it says it's not the case that there's at least one god and then if you think about the attitudes that you can take towards those two propositions right that the uh, other ones right so the atheist accepts one rejects the other theist accepts the other and rejects the one there's all this middle ground of people who are undecided or have never thought about it or and so on that have to be c categorized somehow right so but not only that, if you're if you're going to say that um, an atheist is anyone who doesn't accept that there are gods, and a theist is anyone who doesn't accept that there are no gods, then you're going to end up with agnostics will turn out to include people who are inclined to think that there are gods and people who are inclined to think maybe that there aren't maybe um it depends a little bit so this is some part of the vagueness about agnosticism exactly where the line at each end between agnosticism and theism agnosticism and atheism is going to be drawn that's just right. that, that that's just when we uh when we add in a uh, a libertarian party <laughs> the third option <laughs> well you know, you know there's something to be said for that look at um Again, people have this weird understanding, and they do get it from the, the root word of gnosis, and I think that it's an etymological fallacy, and it's very clear when even Huxley coined the term, and even when Robert Flint was talking about this term. Um, when we're talking about a proposition, right, we're saying that theism is, is the proposition that at least one God exists. If you abstain from, from assigning a truth value to it, if I say, I, I don't believe it's true, um, I don't believe it's false, I am not saying that it is true, and I'm not saying it is false, it has nothing to do with knowledge at that point. That is a a, a basically a, a suspending of judgment on the proposition. So, Dr. Obi, when people say this this adage that uh, agnosticism deal with, deals with knowledge, do you think they're making a fundamental mistake when they're 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 misappropriating uh, misapplying it to the proposition that we're talking about to be agnostic on? Because in that case, agnostic is nothing to do with knowledge. It is just I don't believe P and I don't believe not P. Would, would that be uh, a right. true? So, so I think that that's a standard usage for the term agnostic across the board. So pick any proposition and think proposition and its negation and think about the possible attitudes here. One thing that you can do is suspend judgment about it, whatever it is, uh, and then the natural way to describe your state is to say, so I'm agnostic about that one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I any problem. Problem. in or outside philosophy, it is polysemic. Yeah. Again, SEP makes that very argument that you could be agnostic for any proposition. I'm agnostic on aliens, perhaps, right? I'm agnostic on, um, you know, anything that gives somebody gives you to evaluate that you don't say it's true or false. You could be agnostic on that proposition. But in this particular but, case, when I say I'm agnostic, I'm referring to the proposition of theism because that's the topic that we're referring to. But are, are you are you are you literally saying that you have no knowledge of UFOs or no knowledge of aliens? Um, but see, what I take umbrage is that by in changing the the propositional attitude to knowledge, it's a completely different thing, right? Because the question isn't, do you know if gods exist? Unless you're talking to, to Dawkins or uh, you know uh, who who was it you brought up before that was mentioning you know that uh, 
that some people think it's, it's relating to a certainty, right? But it's not about knowledge and knowledge doesn't even require certainty. So I think that when people change that propositional attitude, you no longer answer the same, answering the same question. If somebody says, do you believe that there are gods? Then I am staying within that same propositional attitude of belief. I do not believe P is true and I do not believe P is false, right? I don't want to change it to knowledge because knowledge is a completely different propositional attitude that is a subset is, of right. 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 So, so how do you, how do you defend the argument when people say, well, when I say agnostic, I just mean um, that I don't have a, a knowledge claim, but I am also an atheist, but, and I don't have a belief claim. Uh, okay. Well, you know what, let me, let me kind of run this by Dr. Opie, because this is one thing that I know Ozzy Mandius, um, maybe even Matt Dillahunty, there's a video with him talking to Anthony Magnabosco on this very topic that he no longer thinks that agnostic atheism, for example, as you mentioned, something along those lines is sensical in the weak case. Um, the reason being is because the way I'm looking at it, and I, and I even talked to, to Matt on this particular topic one time off air, sorry, I don't have a record of it, but he agreed, but said he wouldn't phrase it this way. Now I phrase it this way, Dr. Opie. I don't think it makes sense to epistemically modify a non dostastic quote, position. If you just say, I do not have a belief in God, it doesn't make sense to me to then say, well, I, I also, I don't, I don't have a knowledge of a non-belief because you're just saying then I don't know if I don't believe. So I think that saying agnostic atheism in the, in the weak case is to me is nonsensical. Okay. So I'm not sure I've got this at all, um, <laughs> but it does, I mean, it does seem Certainly the way I use the words, we're, we're talking about exclusive categories here, right? There are atheists, there are theists, there are agnostics, and there, and there are the innocents, the people who have no belief-like attitude. Once we've got those categories, we can ask all kinds of questions about them. We can ask which amongst them claim to know whatever it is that's their position, which is certain, which um, think they've got proofs, which think that it would be irrational to belong to any of the other categories and so on. But that's just additional information about those people. It doesn't change the underlying categories and it doesn't look as though we need to divide up the categories more finely and have new words for certain theists or theists who think they've got proofs or um, agnostics who are really robust in their agnosticism it would be impossible to shift one way or the other and so on i i think there's a really big divide in the atheist community that's not really identified and i mean every every atheist has a justification and a standard of belief for their position and i mean they either reach that uh, inductively or deductively uh, and i think that's a that's a really big distinction that needs to be made in that community Okay, and you could do the same thing with theists as well, I guess, right? Um, I, mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, but uh, but I don't know. But my my whole thing is is that a atheism suspends a atheists suspend their belief on a lack of a uh, verifiable evidence, whereas generally, I mean, pretty much every theist that I speak to. They they uh, they hinge their their position on a a presuppositional belief on on non verifiable evidence. But there's there's already a term for that evidential agnosticism, right? So athe atheism and atheism as as Dr. Opie puts out in his book and numerous other sources, um, has to do with the belief that there are no gods. If you if you say you're suspending judgment on it, right, because of evidential reasons or lack of evidence, that's evidential agnosticism. Um, so I, I think what happens is a lot of atheists somehow take this stipulative definitions and they run with it and try to apply it ubiquitously uh, out there. And that's what I take umbrage of because I, because you, you, if you want to use certain definitions, I've never said I have a problem with that. I mean, that's, I, I kind of do because I think they're, they're imprecise, but you can't, if you want to do that in your communities, that's great. If atheists want to have the approach that atheism is merely not having God belief in their communities. I'm not going to tell them they're not atheists, but what I get, Dr. Opie, is that they're telling me that I am an atheist. They're saying, well, Steve, by definition, by necessity, you are an atheist because you are an agnostic. Yet in philosophy, no, I'm not, and I'm holding to more formal definitions. But they well, say you I mean, do that, and it's, it's a little what disturbing. If, <laughs> what if I was to ask you, what if I was to say, Steve, how many gods do you believe in? Zero. You I don't do, believe in any all, god. You, you do not, do not hold believe a god, god. belief? 
yeah, agnostics do not believe there are God. If agnostics believe there's a God, they would be a theist, right? Because the dichotomy would be, I believe there sure. are gods, or I do not believe sure. there are gods, in classical logic, which is one of the reasons I, I think classical logic is a poor way to describe beliefs. I think you should use dosastic or, or fuzzy so, or multivariable or multivariant. But real quick, let me get Dr. Opie's opinion on it real quick. Sure. Um, when they try to assume agnostics under atheism by saying that you can only be theist or atheist, that there are no other options, that is by necessity, by definition, um, am I am I okay to take umbrage for that? Because again, by going to more formal definitions, it is not by necessity. You do not have to be a theist. You do not have to be atheist. There are other positions that are exclusive, and I would even say mutually exclusive than those positions. So I want to hop back to something I said before, right? Agnosticism. If we're thinking of agnosticism as a position that's intermediate between theists and atheists, then it would make just as much sense to us to subsume them under theists as it does to subsume them under atheists, right? Because they've mm -hmm. suspended judgment. They don't they don't have a view one way or the other, right? So um, you should be I have that argument, happy. by the way, Dr. Opie. I actually have it written down that it, you're much just as much equal to a theist being agnostic than you are an atheist. I actually have that law. I'm a long argument for that. Yeah. So so I think that's that that's so that's what I would say in response to this question. Right. There's, it's actually a kind of mistake to suppose that somehow or other theism, the, the claim that there are gods, sets the kind of standard for the discussion so that everybody else is defined against that. There are two positions. There are no gods or there's at least one god and the two together define the field. And so agnostics should be genuinely intermediate between the two that's, mm -hmm. that's how i think and and it's between the belief that gods exist and the belief that there isn't now i'm willing obviously to concede the point that either you believe that gods exist or you do not again if you if you're holding to the principle by violence sure uh but what what i find is that in the atheist communities they literally are saying if you are not the person that holds to the i believe gods exist you are therefore by default an atheist which again i don't think there's any default position on that proposition but i've been trying to explain to people in so many different ways over five years that this narrative that you have to be theist or atheist is just wrong now granted if you hold to their schema that they hold to then sure under that schema but that's to me that's as well as saying well you're either a chicken or a fish if you're not a fish you're a chicken therefore you know i'm not a fish therefore i'm a chicken I say it, that's it, as it, bad as the that's as bad as the classical theism dichotomy of you're either Christian or you're atheist. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, welcome, sir, the skeptic. Um, and I welcome well, Brian. Uh, I mean, I I mean the, theists who are convinced of their belief, there are aren't they really the only ones in this whole scenario who actually claim to know anything? No, because most theists don't claim yeah. it as a knowledge claim. They claim and it not claim necessarily. It as a when you're when you're dealing with when you're dealing with very strict adherence to various monotheisms, then that can hold true. But for instance, there are monotheistic. Uh, there are mono within monotheism. There's henotheism. There's monolateralism, which are positions that hold that their god is superior. You even have this in Christianity, but that there is still a pantheon of other gods, and that they sure. could be wrong. A lot of time, it's a tentative position. So. Sure. There's there there does have I know that like predominantly we deal with monotheists so that holds true most of the time but there are situations where that does not hold true. I actually right. know I, if you guys remember Dr. Kenny Rhodes, he is a classical theist in the regards that under his schema, if you do not hold to the Christian God beliefs, he would actually place you under atheist, even if you believe with some other God. Which is something that the Romans would have also done back in ancient mm -hmm. uh, during uh, ancient times. That was one of their, uh, before Christianity was actually adopted into their infrastructure, uh, people who didn't believe in the polytheistic gods were also labeled atheists. That's a term that's, a, that's evolved a lot. If you look at the etymology uh, going back the last 2,000 years, that term has had various different definitions, and almost always it's an in-group term for the out-group. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. And Dr. Opie, somebody, uh, a friend of mine in the live chat, um, which is going crazy, by the way, they're, by the way, they're loving this. So thank you very much for this. Um, but my friend Zero, he mentions, uh, most, he says most people uh, consider non-theism, right? Because you have theism or not theism, we'll call that non-theism. They, they consider non-theism to be atheism. Now, I, I again, I, I take a little umbrage with that term most because in my experience, because I run a community of thousands of, of, of people, most of them are atheists, a good chunk of them are atheists. I took a poll 
75 percent of them use the formal definitions they they are atheists by the fact that they believe that there are no gods they're fine with that so in your experience is it really the case that 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 people think that non-theism is equating to atheism or is that just something we find more on youtube hmm. okay so that's i historically i think people have for various reasons have not been that interested in the distinctions that we're drawing so if you think about um, national census so i'll use the australian one because i'm familiar with that um, there's a there's a kind of list of things that you can claim to be like christian or buddhist or hindu and then there's one that's sort of other right mm -hmm. and that's how it was originally and just there were atheists and agnostics and all kinds of things put in there um, later the census was changed so that uh you got there was a category so you could tick not having not having a belief in god as a box that still didn't distinguish the way that i use the terms between the atheists and the agnostics it didn't distinguish between the people who think that there are no gods and the people who just fail to believe that there are uh, and there are reasons for being interested in these two different categories Right. So what I mean, the, the fight here, I mean, if there are fights about this, it's not so much over a, a word, I think it's over the importance of recognizing differences between the two categories. Right. So the, the people who think that there are no gods, there's a whole lot of interesting social scientific research, which suggests that they're different in certain kinds of ways from the people who merely lack the belief. Sure. I mean, and you also have to have to take into account local gods versus global gods, uh, local atheism versus global atheism. You know, uh, it, it, it makes very much sense for a person to be a local atheist for somebody to be, uh, you know, an atheist about their own uh, societal or cultural deities. But for uh, for somebody who hasn't studied another deity, it's a lot uh, it's a lot. It, it's both easier and harder for them to say that there is no other God than than the local one. No, I agree, but I think what happens is we lose granularity when we, we start yes. trying to put all these things together. And I think there is a distinction, obviously, between local and, and global atheism. And I like the nuances. These, you, you guys may know, I mean, I have thousands of videos, and a lot of them deal with my nuance type thing, right? I mean, so I spent a lot of time the last five years talking about not just semantic stuff, but really in-depth differences between positions. And to, to slam them all together to say you have to be this or that, I think you just lose precision. And, and especially when you're saying, well, if you're just not atheist, you mean you're not. If you don't believe in God, you're you're non-theist, equating it to atheism. You subsume theological and cognitivist. You subsume yeah. ichthyist, which I again I have an argument against that. And I I, I actually I have ask, a video against that. You had a good video on that, by the way. But let me ask Dr. Opie, we cook on theological and cognitivist. Why I got him here, and I I, I <laughs> an hour is going to buy real quick. Um, theological and cognitivism. To me, my argument is simple. If you don't have a belief because you're a theological cognitivist and you think that the proposition of theism is not actually a proposition, do you consider a category error or even maybe possibly a contradiction to assume a cognitivist position to a, a non-cognitivist position to one that is a cognitivist? Because atheism has to be a cognitivist position because it's a position on a proposition, right? So is there, is there a problem by them saying, well, if you're a theological cognitivist, you're, you're on Macklin atheist because the theological cognitivist says, I can't be an atheist. I can't be a theist because both those are propositional and it's not even a proposition. Okay, so there's a long history to this, I mean, a long history of discussion of this kind of question. So in Language, Truth and Logic, Eyre wanted to argue that the word God was meaningless. You couldn't make propositions that contained the word God so that if you considered the claim there are, there's at least one God, he said that's just meaningless. So there's no problem. And by that, he meant really, there's no proposition there to consider. Yeah, that's more of an ichthyist. So, but yeah, he's saying, so, so, he, he's saying the whole proposition is meaningless because yeah, God is and, he's not cognitive. Okay. And so he said, I'm not, I'm not an atheist. I'm not an agnostic. There's no proposition with respect to which these positions can be mm -hmm. defined. So that was Ayer's view. Now, there it's kind of tricky to um, defend his position because there's all kinds of things that we say, you know, so-and-so believes in God, 
the Romans thought there were lots of gods and so on, that just look like they're meaningful sentences. And they wouldn't be if the word God was meaningless. Right. So uh, it's a hard line, that, that non-cognitivist line, uh, or at any rate, the way that air develops it, the, the idea that any sentence that's got the word God in it is meaningless, is very hard to defend. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. Yeah. I think I think theism and theological cognitivism are very, very. Um, I, I wouldn't. Be, I can't imagine being justified to hold those positions, even though I kind of used to uh, subscribe to theological cognitivists when I started. But after I learned more, I'm I'm like I can't I can't hold to this because it's not justifiable. But but the question more is the people that do consider themselves to be an ichthyist or especially a theological yeah. cognitivist. Um, is there a category error by claiming now that those theological and cognitivists are atheists because? One's a cognitivist position and the other's not. So I'm, one of the things, I guess, that's important in this is to go back to the kind of beginning. So the word atheist gets used in lots of different kinds of ways. And there are lots of people who want to use it um, in ways different from the way that I stipulated in my book. Uh, and there may be reasons for that that have to do with kind of social factors that, um, you know, that it's desirable or to be counted as an atheist sure. in certain so social circles or whatever, to be able to call yourself an atheist rather than have to call yourself something else. Um, I mean, one advantage is that kind of broadly, most people have some idea about what atheism is. Theological non-cognitivism, not so much. That's just gonna make lots of people scratch their heads. So you can see that there are gonna be reasons why people would like to be able to use that label. It won't fit if you, it, it won't fit with the usage of many people, but uh, in some respects you might think, it's fine, we need, a, we need a label. One of the labels that we need is for that broad collection of people that from my point of view would pick up atheists, agnostics, and then theological non-cognitive. Yeah, no, I get it for sense, I get it for senses or for, um or more especially for the normalization of atheism, my, my question is very specific, just relating to the logic itself, just relating to the right. set. Is is there a problem with the set? Even though, yeah, sure, you you can uh, you, you can bypass that and say, yes, this is obviously a set issue or logical error, but we're going to use some kind of umbrella term for census, uh, you know, other than nons, because nons is a real popular thing. And again, I am pro trying to normalize atheism as far as the term, right? Um, I think that it does need to be normalized because there is a still a slight stigma with it. But my question is very specifically more toward, I do believe that it's a category error um, straight out using the sets. So I guess it's only a category error relative to some set of stipulations about what the terms mean, right? So we, we could, I, usage wins out. So if in 70 years time, the word atheist is used to pick out that assortment of um, what, what what I'm going to call atheists, agnostics, non-cognitivists, you know, the, that range, uh, well, then that just will be what the term means if that's how everybody uses it, right? There's no kind of magic meanings that attach to terms. That's not how it is at the moment, though. At the moment, mm. there, there's a lot of we people wanting to use the terms in different ways and arguing with one another about so, kind of sensible ways of using the terms. And that hasn't, you know, it is what it is now and it'll be whatever it is in 100 years' time. Sure, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I do believe that usage plays an important role in how we use these words. But it, uh, again, I'm only going by modern vernacular and, and when i'm reading stuff but uh sure. jimmy had a um yeah uh, I'll, I'll just i'll just curious so what would you how would you identify somebody other than the word atheist uh, as somebody as myself who is an, an explicit atheist on a on a local level but an implicit atheist on a global level so okay so now i um You'll need to explain to me exactly what you mean, but I so, take it that so, what you mean is if we think about, say, the, the the various Christian gods that are believed in by people around you, you say there's no such sure. gods, right? Right. Like um, like every every god god concept that has been presented to me, I I, I don't believe in. But I'm not so, I'm, I'm not saying that 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 no gods exist, which which some people would call it weak atheism, but I would call it strong atheism on a local level and weak atheism on a global level. Right. So, um, so, so you think for any 
God that anyone has ever believed exists, you think that, no, there's no God of that kind. But you're leaving it open that there might be some kind of unconsidered or not thought of yet God that exists. Sure, sure. Uh, But well, because as somebody else's uh, uh, concept of a god or my concept of a god could be a a, a technologically advanced race that's uh, that's so far you know uh, past my own understanding that it, it appears to be supernatural i guess in that case though you would say they weren't really gods they were just advanced aliens right because... yeah exactly they, they wouldn't really be gods but but to somebody who couldn't conceive the technology they Jim, would most certainly be gods I, 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 when i hear somebody present that argument that um, I've only an atheist to the gods I've heard before. I think to me that they're trying to hedge their bets because the question isn't, are you atheist towards the, or atheistic toward the gods you've heard of? The question is, is there a God? And people remember my flow chart, which some people criticize, I think yeah. fairly. And I think that they're the only, the only thing that, I, that was fairly criticized on my, my flow chart is I put solid, hard solipsism in a position for the, on the epistemology only because I had uh, no, I loved it. Go. Just dead end. Yeah. Dead it end. just did it. Cause, well, because what the hell is dostastic um, nihilism, really? Cause right, like, you, you, got, you got nowhere to go but down. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, I didn't know what to put there, so I got to expand on that on part of my, was great. my, my thing. <laughs> You're just a hard solipsist. But my first question was, does God exist? And people criticize, well, that's not a proposition. But the reason why I put does God exist is because that's the great debate question. I put but it, is, it, is, it is a proposition because as soon as you ask somebody no, on a question. personal no, level, no. on a local level, they immediately identify that 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 nomenclature well, it's not, with, it's not a with a concept. Proposition is either true or false, right? It's a question. Does God exist, right? It, a proposition is God exists. That would be true or false. But sure, a prop, sure. so the question is, does God exist? And that's the reason why I like the the nomenclature that I use in in, in Doctor Opie's book is that that question now becomes yes. Uh, then you're a theist. No, you're an atheist. And then if you say, I, I don't know, uh, you can put that under agnostic. I don't care. An apatheist. What does God mean? It has no meaning. Atheist, which again, I have issues with. But um, that's the reason why I started with that question, right? I didn't start with a proposition for, for a specific reason, because the, the great debate question has always been, does God exist? Now, when you say, well, I'm only atheist toward local gods. Well, that's not the question, though. The question is, is do you do, do you, is there any ontological God out there? If you answer no, then you hold a belief that there are no gods. And I think that if I had to give you a position, you know, but you, but, you, but you're arguing you, ontology, you, but you're, you're arguing ontology using epistemological methods. No, because I'm, I'm asking you what your ontology is with, with regard to the existence of the state of affairs of the universe. If you say, um, I don't know if gods exist or not, you're agnostic. What if, what if I, gods exist and you're just saying, I'm not assigning that to be true or false. What if I tell you that, uh, well, I've only studied, you know, this, this, and this, and this God, and I don't believe in any of them. You're still, I would put you under agnostic. It, it, to me, again, and again, this, uh, take any nomenclature schema you want, but if you don't have the belief that there are no gods, then you don't fall so, under philosophical atheism. So there's a, there, there's a way that this can be parsed out that makes the distinction pretty clear. Um, so let's say that you're a, a theist of any kind. Um, do you, does your position change just because I make up, like I say, I make up a God. Um, in some of my last few videos, I made up a, a, a hypothetical scenario where two gods fight each other in the supernatural realm, destroy the natural realm, come together, and then that creates the Big Bang, basically going, hey, look, I just granted that a God exists and your religion's still wrong. Um, but, I just did but, that. But, I did that. The, the, the position that you're arguing from, though, is that the theist already holds a positive position. I do. Okay. But what is your position, irregardless of the made-up God that I just proposed? Uh, well, if if it if it doesn't make sense to me, I mean, if it's not if it's not conceptual, then I I I immediately reject it. Okay. Then, if that is the case for practically any other deity that can be proposed to you, then what is your position? Some some deities, and, and I mean, uh, inarguably, have better defenses than others. Okay, but whether or not they have good defenses is not the question. Right. The question is not how how well right. defined the apologetics are. Mm-hmm. Um, the question is what your position is, regardless of their defense for the position. Right. He's asking you what your belief is, your dosastic position. Do you believe they're God? Well, see, and 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 that's the thing. It's all conceptual because is is this God? Uh, is this God immortal? Is this God corporeal? Is this God? 
I mean, is this God uh, a human? Is this God? Well, just uh, I, okay. God? I, I, I think you're going down the whole naturalistic God argument that G-Man uses. And one of the arguments that I've never had a chance to talk to G-Man about, which I hopefully probably never will, unless we go on Drunken Peasants, he wouldn't understand it. But there's something called the identity of indiscernibility or the indiscernibles that if right. two things have exactly the same properties, they're indistinguishable from each other. And I would ask him, what's the difference? If I say the sun is a God, what's the difference between that as a naturalistic God and one that isn't a God. There has to be a distinguishing property between the two or else they're the same thing. Exactly. But once you start applying uh, uh, um, personification to it and you start saying that it's loving and that it's all knowing and stuff like that, then that's when you start separating a well, star you're, 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 you're from a deity. Qualities, right? You're, 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 you're almost putting it as a supernatural deity. If, if, it's, if an inanimate object has exactly. ability to love, there's super. There's something maybe supernatural going on. But Dr. Obi, exactly. what do you think and about that? The, Let's get his opinion. Let's get Dr. Opie real quick to kind of weigh in on this. I know he's either losing his mind or, <laughs> or, or going, okay, um, hopefully this makes sense. But no, I was thinking so the reason why, or well, part of what I think is that naturalism is the correct view. So there are none but natural entities with none but natural causal powers. That's, that's what I say. I also say that gods, by definition, would be supernatural entities with supernatural mm -hmm. causal powers. So if my naturalism is correct, there are no gods, right? Mm -hmm. Full stop. By the way, and things like, sorry? I, I, I argue, and I even got flack for this, and I couldn't believe this. I argue that if you hold to ontological naturalism or philosophical naturalism, to, to be rational, you have to hold to philosophical atheism and be a strong atheist you can't have you can't say that right. i'm a naturalist and then I, I merely lack a belief in god that i think is dishonest intellectually dishonest in some ways or at least but, irrational but then again it also depends on your concept of god not everybody's concept of god is supernatural or, well, or not corporeal. I, I disagree it doesn't depend on your concept it one entails the other if you if you are a philosophical naturalist it has to be that it entails there are no supernatural beings. Thus, there are no deities. Yes, no, no, no you supernatural strong, strong beings. Strong atheist at that point. Was was Romulus supernatural? Yeah, there was there was some deification there. I think. Yeah, there was some deification, but I mean, but people people worshipped him as a man. Right, but well, I, this goes kind of goes into the argument that uh, uh, Ocean I've had on the Emperor. But but Dr. Opie, would you agree oh, yeah. if, if there is no difference between a natural god and a, and a non-natural god? Again, if there's no distinguishing things between a son that's a god and a son that's not a god, then if you're a naturalist, doesn't it make sense to be rational? You must hold there are no supernatural gods, which is a philosophical atheist. Mm. Okay, so I guess we what well, at this point what we need is some account of what natural properties are that will help us to... So, so if we think about the sun, does the sun just have natural properties or does it have supernatural, exactly. supernatural powers of some kind? And that would be the question to ask, right? So if, if we agree that there are no... Um, that, I mean, I don't know how to... What would be a supernatural property of the sun to begin with? I, I would even know. I, I think the sun would be a completely natural. That maybe that it rises and, and falls on its own will. I mean, but that actually only on a flat Earth model is that a problem? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't rise and fall. It goes in a circle. I mean, don't you read a map? I mean, come oh, on. oh, but it also changes whenever it wants when the don't, seasons don't, change. Don't expose the flat Earth model. <laughs> Try to fight it. I, I, I Dr. Obi, I got to be a, a rabbit hole, but have you ever watched any of our flat earth discussions where we just annihilate flat earth? It's it, no, no, I haven't. Oh, it's you're you would be in for a treat. I, I'd imagine that annihilating, and, and this is with a little bit of flat earth discussion I've taken part in, annihilating flat earth basically just comes to do you have a surgeon nearby? Can they cut open your skull? Is there a brain in it? Congratulations, you've annihilated flat earth. <laughs> I uh, I was talking to uh, the founder of Atheist Republic today, Armin Navabi, and I was telling him how excited I was to be working with uh, with uh, Atheist Alliance of America in um, their uh, and they're going to help help uh, Atheist Republic promote our National Atheist Day, uh, National Atheist Coming Out Day, which we've been approved of as a as an, an official observance day. It's going to be March twenty third, and uh, I was I was sending him a, a voice message and. After I sent it to him, he sent me back one just dying, laughing, and I couldn't figure out what was what was uh, what was so funny. And I, I said, "What?" And he said, "Go, go back, listen to your message." 
Well, I was telling them about Atheist Alliance of America, and I was telling them uh, how they were giving out, uh, uh, giving out Dawkins, uh, the, the Dawkins Award, and that Richard Dawkins would present it uh, with uh, on, on behalf of uh, um, Atheist Alliance of America. And uh, a Freudian slip, and I said, uh, I said, yes, yeah, I'm really, really stoked to see who they give the Darwin Award to this year. <laughs> 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 I wasn't aware so that I anybody. Sue, I, gotta, I have to sue now for not an, having an official agnostic day. Okay, great. So. I wasn't aware that anybody other than Kent Hovind had gotten the Darwin Award for the last forty years. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know. He, There's a the guy trying to make he, toast in the bathtub. He's the only official living person that's ever received the Darwin Award. Um, well, let's let's move on to my my because uh, I know we got a limited amount of time. So, but but just to sum that up. Um, it's not too crazy to say that if you're a philosophical naturalist, you're a strong atheist, right? It, I think it does entail the other one. But. So, so in my book on naturalism and religion that I published earlier this year, that's what I say. Given the way that I've defined all the terms in the book, it's just okay. it's just a straight entailment from naturalism to atheism. Yeah, but that again, makes perfect sense to me. You know, that that depends on a certain amount of stipulation, but it shouldn't seem cr completely crazy. I, I that's that way I would put it as well. So so let's dive into the, the, the part where everybody is really wanting you to know the people that are tuning in right now. Um, a lot of them know that my argument that I, I started to have a discussion with Dr. Malik, who wrote a paper called Defining Atheism, the Burn of Proof. And he's a very nice guy. Matter of fact, I, I'm just thrilled that we've had such great communication in the last month or so. Um, unfortunately, he lives in, in the United Arab Emirates and they don't have Skype. But they don't have they don't allow face to face kind of things for some strange reason, um, and so he's been leaving me a phone call to call, and it's completely time zone a problem, and so I haven't had a chance to actually communicate with him verbally, and I'm, I, I know he wants to. He really is thrilled by having a conversation with me, and we've been having awesome emails. But uh, Dr. Opie had actually read that paper, and he's familiar with my argument. And so this argument that has been making many waves throughout the atheist communities, I know that uh, Avian Atheist Republic is familiar, familiar with it, Mock Atheist Sirs is well familiar with it, uh, Brian's familiar with it. And the argument is just basically something that I don't even think is that contentious when looking into epistemology. It's basically saying that anybody who has a belief, and if that belief is even still a position, or excuse me, anybody who has a position um, has a burden of proof. And I mean that interchangeably with a burden of justification. Now, I will capitulate that in legalese, burden of proof means a little bit different. It's more evidential. It has to do with burden of production and burden of persuasion. But in epistemology, those, and, I've, and even I have uh, excuse me, uh, Ozzy Ramdes, the second on my Facebook page, just recently said he uses these terms interchangeably as well. So I think that I, I'm not out in left field by doing that. But, but my argument is that, that even if you don't believe in a God, you still have to justify why you reject somebody's claim you still have to explain to them why you don't believe them to have a have a dialectic and that's all my argument really is saying is that because all beliefs to be rational need to be justified excluding properly basic beliefs for now that if you just are in a conversation and you don't believe somebody there is a burden of some kind a trivial one that i refer to as a second order justification because it's not on the proposition to justify why you don't believe the person so, Dr. Albert, can you kind of give me some of your, your feedback on that? And, and like I said, I know that you've, you've read Dr. Malik's work, and I think we agree and disagree on the same points with his paper. So, um, so I don't, I, I actually don't like the use of the expression burden of proof in connection with philosophy because of its legal mm -hmm. associations. And there's, there's a famous paper by David Lewis, Evil for Freedom's Sake, which he ends. So, I just want to read this. So, he's He's reached the point of saying that there's a certain there's a certain thing that's a bit inconclusive, and he says some will want to play on by debating which side bears the burden of proof. Myself, I think this pastime is as useless as it is undignified. And in the spoken version of the paper, he then ad libbed, "Are we lawyers?" Right. So it was clear that his view was that um, talking about burden of proof about who's responsible for the next move in the debate or who has to defend themselves or whatever is pointless and undignified, as he says. And um, this is not a substantive point, uh, really. It's just a way of kind of moving into saying that I think that I just agree with you about um, the point that when it comes to our believing, everybody's responsible for their beliefs. If you're a sort of responsible believer, then you will have believed well. And if you're prepared to enter into a discussion with someone 
and it turns out that you disagree on a point, then you should be prepared if you want to continue on in the discussion to, to say why it is that you believe as you do to try to work out what's the point of difference between you and the person that you're discussing with. And there are no special burdens that go to one side or the other just because of the particular beliefs that they have. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. And I, and I don't mean to make it to be a special condition, right? I think these things are normative. Um, and the people that have listened to my argument, I think a lot of them would be like, oh, well, if you just change that to burden and justification, then they're fine with that, right? I don't have too many people, I think, have complained too much. There's some outliers that have said, you know, look, a person who doesn't believe has no justification, no burden whatsoever. Now, I disagree with that very strongly. And the reason being is if I said to, to Lawrence, hey, Lawrence, um, reality exists and you say you don't believe me, um, I think you need to be justified why you don't think reality exists, right? To be rational, because I think to be a rational person, you have to either, me personally, as a, as a more classical type foundationist, I just assume um, that the universe exists. I, I take it as, a, as an axiom. I'm okay with that. But would you agree that be rational, you have to have some kind of, of foundation or coherentism or something to say that reality is real. And if you don't believe reality is real, that to me implies you're irrational. So I would expect there to be a justification for that. So why is it any different than atheism? If an atheist says, I don't believe the theist, which again, I don't like that whole, I don't believe their claim, but for argue, excuse me, for arguendo, um, if somebody says, I don't believe the theist, or look at, I don't believe that there are gods, why is that any different? To be rational, should you not be, have to justify that for the same reasons as why you justify you don't believe reality is real, if that was the case? I mean, would this apply to any claim? Any, anything. These are all, this is what I think I think that yeah. I, I, I have to emphasize enough. But, this is not just toward atheism. My arguments toward any proposition, toward any dialectic. But the, the only problem is that the only way that you're going to convince anybody outside of manipulating uh, somebody's naivety, you would you would have to present them with with some sort of evidence that would meet their 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 standards or their uh, their, their standards of, of belief. And it's really hard for a theist to do that because they're they are operating from from unsubstantiated claims but we're talking about yourself we're talking about well, these are self-assessments yeah no, 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 exactly but, but, no, but it's critical it's autobiographical in a way right um look at if i'm asking you jim is the earth flat or so I, let me say is the earth round is the earth round and you say i don't know i'm going to take you to be an irrational person unless you can justify why you don't have a belief in that now there's sometimes you don't have to have a justification um dr opie in his in his atheism and agnosticism, I love this. You use the term innocence to describe people that have never been exposed to a proposition. Which right? is They're justification. Not atheists. Yeah, that is, their ju that is an in in intrinsic justification that doesn't need any actual justification because they've right. never been exposed to the proposition. And, and I think it, that and was brilliant <clears throat> to put it that way. I, somebody else does as well, Dr. Friedman, I think, from her paper, Suspending Judgment. But Dr. Obi, real quick, do you want to expand upon that? Why a person who is innocent, who has never been exposed to the proposition, is already self-justified? So... I guess I'm not, depends what you mean by justified. Like if you've got a belief, you might be able to tender some justification for having the belief. If you're innocent, you don't know about the proposition. So it's a bit odd to talk about um, justification in that sense because- They don't have, yeah, there is no- you, You're not yeah, in a position yeah. to be able to do that. But you can certainly say something like, um, let, let's suppose you've got the right conditions, that they're not culpable, right? It's, they've got a perfectly good excuse why they, they're innocent, right? Now, you don't, you don't put innocent in right? or whatever the, you know, whatever the well, story might be. The, 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 the only problem is, is that once you start accepting new information, you are no longer innocent because you now have knowledge of the opposite claim. Well, that's, this is somebody like, for example, there's, years ago, there's people that put out this narrative that if you're a baby, you're an atheist, you're born atheist. And even, even gone so far to say inanimate objects are atheists, right? There are people out there that have videos that, that do argue. And, and logically in their schema, it does follow, unfortunately, because of set theory, that rocks, atoms, quarks, stars, are all atheists now i think this is well, that's because they have the they have this idea that everything that lacks a belief must right, be an atheist right. and, but, I, and, but, and it, but, it follows it follows from a set from, from a universal set so that if you're talking with sets and complementary sets but putting aside the, 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 the problem logic with is it, not though, flawed, is that you can't... Second, in their schema i want to ask dr opie why i got him here because i we're, we're quickly running out of time i don't want to keep him too long do you think it makes sense to say babies are are atheist or inanimate objects like rocks are atheist there's going to be a problem with this because the person lacks the belief that there are no gods and also lacks the belief that there are gods and also lacks, I mean, you know, 
anyway, but put that put that to one side. Um, no, I know I say in um, I can't remember now whether it's in this this book, the Atheism and Agnosticism book, or if it's in the Atheism the Basics book, that uh, it was just a mistake for Holbach to say that babies are atheists because he did say that, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of like. Um, so what so what did I say there? Uh, it's as if, you know, um, babies lack political beliefs, but that doesn't make them little anarchists, right? It's uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's actually, yeah. Not, I, I mean, uh, what uh, their parents might yeah. say. That, that's a good way to yeah, put it. I, I actually think that that once a a I mean that for one, inanimate objects cannot suspend their judgment of a belief without being conscious. So we can go ahead and just eliminate that right now. But I will, I, 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 I will say that I think rocks can be agnostic, but that's another story. Uh, but uh, I, as far as babies go, as, as soon as, as a baby is presented with information and starts, uh, starts rationalizing that information and starts actually plugging it into algorithms mentally and, and, uh, and uh, uh, really, uh, appealing to their to their belief system until they accept that belief they're they're not anything yeah well again i think these positions are things things that people come to i think that there have to we have some kind of cognitive uh, exactly or executive decision making yeah. well, uh, it, i think it, it's nonsensical to say a rock is an atheist i think it's nonsensical to say a baby's an atheist i i vehemently just, just think that's a horrible way of approaching it yeah um, now again i will admit that it's consistent in their schema um, but but no no it's it, it's not because it, in order to well, be it, is, it, because right. in order to be an atheist you have to be aware of a theism. Well no well first of all a, we've just and by the way well, we got Dr. Opie here. Uh, Stanford Encyclopedia makes it very clear. Um, it is it is an etymological fallacy. They don't use that terminology, but to say that atheism means without theism. Matter of fact, Cambridge doesn't even put it as of without. It, it makes it very clear that not means negation, as in the negation of the proposition. So the proposition is God exists. The negation is God does not exist. So that's where the negation goes. It's not the um, it's not without gods. Now it may have been a very much long time ago because it meant without the Roman gods, right? The Christians right. were without the, without the Roman gods, so they were considered to be atheos but heathens <laughs> yeah the damn heathens um but go ahead. so 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 one thing to note here just a kind of interesting historical note is that the word atheism came into english about 80 years before the word theism i try to tell people so that atheism was in town was actually a term in use for about 80 years in english before the word theism now right. it's true that atheism derived from atheos it goes back to the great but it's still an interesting historical fact right i've, I've told well, people that they think i'm crazy but would you agree that a is meant is ought, and i use the word ought as normative here obviously that if you, again generally speaking a and an athe and atheist means not it doesn't mean without it means the negation of theism or the beliefs that there are no gods right but but even even in uh using using that that uh uh entomology you would i mean you would still have to have knowledge of of that okay, that god before you can just you, you keep changing the propositional attitude and i see this but, a lot, and i don't know why but, we're talking but, about belief how, we're talking about uh, belief systems yeah but yeah but what i'm saying is is how can you claim that something doesn't exist that you don't even have knowledge of of its claim in the, in the first aliens, place i can say aliens exist i have no knowledge either way i can make a probabilistic argument but, but we do exist but you have a knowledge of the uh, but you have a knowledge of the aliens right I, know, I have no knowledge of aliens one way or another sure you do you know that aliens are not from earth that they are visitors no, from no, space. i have knowledge of the concept of aliens exactly that we would yes we would know about aliens but i have no knowledge existentially whether aliens exist or not it's a huge difference and I use knowledge propositionally. I don't use it as explicit knowledge, as in something that right, right. Horrible. But but so. if if somebody did not know that uh, that anybody claimed any supernatural deity existed, how how can they very well be an atheist? Because they would well, have to first reject the claim that they know nothing of. Well, again, the, the atheists are the people that reject. But I, I would put it this way: That's what I'm saying, you could mirror these things very easily. If we happen to, to define. Uh, or happen to frame atheism in, in, with respect to theism. The theism is the proposition that at least one God exists, therefore the negation of that or the rejection, such that it is the belief that gods don't exist. We could frame that the other way. We could make it just as easy as say, hey, you know what? The proposition is gods do not exist. 
And if you believe that, you're an atheist. But if you don't believe that, now all of a sudden you're a theist. And that makes no sense to me, although that's how it would mirror. No, Be no, no, no. Yes, it would. Think, no, about no. think about this very carefully, Jim. If I have the position, and we'll get Dr. Opie to, to weigh in on this, hopefully, because this has been something of contention. But if I say that there are no gods, if I have the proposition that, no, that at least one god does not exist, right. if I believe that, I'm a theist. And now what the weak atheist or the implicit atheist or the, the colloquial atheist does, it says, well, if you don't believe that's true, you lack a belief in that or you don't have that belief, you are now considered it's assumed to be an atheist because you have that economy of atheism and theism. That they that they've made same thing. If if you, you, let me finish. Same thing that's reversed with the mirror. If I have the proposition that no gods exist, and you adhere to that, you think that's true. You're an atheist. But by the same reasoning, again, we're, philosophy is all about reasoning. By the same reasoning, if you don't adhere to that, you would be consumed under theism, whether you have a god belief or not. I uh, see. I I, I, I disagree logical. though. In I, I disagree though. In 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 the in in the way that, that I'm putting it with somebody without prior knowledge. Now, if if in your case, if you were to suspend a belief that you already have, then yes, you would be a theist. If you if you if you suspended your disbelief and uh, if, if you if you said uh, I no longer believe that gods don't exist, then yes, you would become a theist. But if you had an absence. An absence of that of that belief in the first Both place, or an absence of, of, of the absence. Or, or, all, all people that suspend judgment don't believe in God. There is an absence there. No, I'm talking about an absence of the knowledge of the deity, or or, 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 or the, the God knowledge. concept, or, or a God, gods, the word God, the, the definition of God. All right, let me get let me do Dr. Opie's a, a thing on here. And by the way, do you agree that he keeps switching between? Uh, yeah, no, no, I'll, 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 I'll agree with you, but okay. but I think there's a difference so, between absence of belief and 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 suspension of belief. Well, there there is, but all people that suspend judge, all agnostics lack don't have a belief. All atheists don't have a belief. All apathists but, don't have a belief. But not all non-believers suspend have to suspend right, their belief. I, I some some are right. just absent of that belief. Right. I I fully right. agree with you on that. There, so, that's why so, there are different positions. So part of the issue here is what to say about about potential believers who lack the relevant concepts so they can't form the thought, right? That's the point that you're making. So babies may be, um, can't, and babies can, lack the concept of God and so can't have any attitude to any proposition about gods, for example, that there are gods or there, there aren't. But as they grow, perhaps eventually they'll acquire the concept. Once they've acquired it, then either they believe that there are gods or they believe that there are no gods or they suspend judgment. They, they mm -hmm. kind of end up in one of the other states. But at the other end of life, you can lose concepts as dementia sits in. You can go back to the not being atheist, agnostic, or theist, but being innocent because yep, you no longer have totally the capacity agree. to frame the thought again. And so, and then, you know, there are other cases like um, uh, chimpanzees are kind of interesting. They have various concepts, not sure whether they can frame the God concept though. So probably they're just innocents as well, but that's a kind of empirical question, you know. But do you, does my mirroring work? By the way, I got that mirroring from actually, if you go to Use of Reason from Dr. Malpass, he used a very similar approach. Uh, sure. I, uh, I mean, that argument is one that I've kind of adverted to a couple of times while we've been talking as well. I mean, I, that, that's part of the, you, the, the, the point about the symmetry of the situation here. There are two propositions. Those two propositions, there are no gods, there's at least one god, are then used to define a bunch of attitudes. And it better not be that you treat theism and atheism asymmetrically mm -hmm. like there would be something there is something very weird happening do, do, you, do you do you so you do consider atheism and theism um from your schema as contraries if one's true the other one has to be yeah. false yeah. okay and and also um somebody had actually said in the uh, live chat by the way i'm paying attention to the live chat thank you all for watching um they say well if an agnostic can believe in god and now in this scheme that we're talking about in in the literature that i read Yes, you can use agnostic as an epistemic modifier, but that's not how it's normally done. And if you're an agnostic, you cannot be theist or atheist. Those are different positions altogether. They are mutually exclusive. Would you agree, Dr. Opie? Opie? Yeah, so, yes, let me say one other thing too. Um, an, an agnostic can be quite sure about certain gods that they do not exist. Absolutely. Right? I, like a younger what, creation... What, I don't, I th those don't, they, if, 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 a, if a God is contingent upon the earth being 7,000 years old, that God does not exist straight up. I am strong atheist toward that God. If that's using Jim's 
schema there, which I, I think is weird. But um, but yeah, I, I I will flat out say those gods do not exist. I believe those that type of god does not exist if it's contingent upon the Earth being seven thousand years old. The reason being, the Earth isn't seven thousand years old. So what you're saying is you're a naturalist, Steve. No, I don't. I, I don't know. <laughs> the funniest thing, I don't hold, I don't hold ontological naturalism. I hold yeah, no, I'm just fucking with you. Although the people that hold the methodology, I mean, the ontological naturalism, I get it, right? I do understand why they do that. Sure. What bugs me is when you say have somebody says they're an ontological naturalist, but they won't say that there are no gods. I find that to be inconsistent. Well, that's that's only if if you if you uh, hold the definition of of a god to be supernatural or existing definitely outside natural law. Look at again, I I think it's a ridiculous argument to say we whether gods I, are natural. I natural. think it is too, Steve. I mean, fuck, I do I do too. But the thing is, is that it's an argument. Well, if no, it is, there because there are people who argument. there are people who attribute gods to natural things. Absolutely. Well, there are natural. The term "natural gods" to me originally was somebody, for example, a god. I don't, that had I don't think that's what's being discussed when someone says "natural gods." Right. We, we, you've read it, the incarnations and incarnate mortality, and you're a polytheist, so you're well familiar with certain gods having controlling over dominion over something that is natural. That's when I when I hear right. naturalistic gods. That's what I've always thought of until I met G Man, and then my whole life changed and i got and then we got into our roman empire, roman we got, empire we, we, which i mentioned earlier in this stream by the way i forgot okay. about you, <laughs> but you but i think that I, I think that's the, that the last time we had this conversation i wound up agreeing with you well yeah but, I, 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 i'm good I, you know what you and i could spend hours and hours and hours talking about this we do like to sway people we do have a burden of persuasion because we are trying to change you know it's, it, we were trying to influence people and uh, you know, Dr. Obi, I, uh, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're okay on time with you and we're ready to jet. Just please let me know. We get, we, we're ending this at any time and it might have an after show to talk about certain things. Um, but you know, we talk about these discussions for a lot, for many, many years. I've known Ocean for quite some time. And these, these, some of my newer friends like Jim, I, I've only known for about two months, but he's fast becoming one of my, my favorite people. Um, we, we, we you're awesome, man. You really are. And I, I mean that. Um, oh, no, but, neither Steve or Ocean for years seems like that would be terribly hard. Where the hell are you, Sharers? And how'd you get in here? <laughs> now, I, love, I love everybody here. Everybody's great people. Um, but I, what I see is this narrative putting out by the bigger channels. I mean, yes, Non Sequitur Show is, is substantial nowadays, it's, it's decent size. We have a few thousand people watching sometimes. But you know, compared to the, the atheist experience in those channels, which I have a lot of respect for, I do watch them. I, I think Matt Dillahunty is brilliant in what he does. We don't agree on a lot of things. And by the way, there is talk that him and I will, might be having a discussion. Um, he's not hes not against me, by the way, I found out. He actually doesn't think I'm an idiot, which is good. Um, he, he just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, high praise for Matt. Right? <laughs> well, he's not an idiot, at least. Okay. But, I mean, Steve, idiot, don't worry. Idiot, I think no, you're an idiot. Don't think maybe. You. But, 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 but Dr. Opie, do you, do, you, do you see that my, my whole stance is trying to put a, a different um, positions out there that might Brussel against the narrative that the mainstream YouTube atheists have been indoctrinated. And I use that word specifically indoctrinated to believe because they've never been exposed to actually reading papers. And I had put it out before that the people that are generally saying that I'm wrong are the people that have never read a, a peer reviewed paper. They've never opened a book on the topic. They have never gone to college for epistemology. And again, I'm a pure lay person when it comes to this topic. My background was in nuclear uh, reactor technologies. But I spent four or five years with uh, under the tutelage of people like Dr. Malpass and Ozzy and brilliant people that I have the utmost respect for, who sent me reading material, including you know your your writings. Um, how do you, does, does, I don't even know how to rephrase this, but can you at least see my position as somebody who who wants to be correct, wants to know truths, that holds to an agnostic position, fighting against this massive stream of people that are just not really you know bothering to look into my arguments and just saying by fiat that I'm wrong? So I'm not sure how to respond to that exactly. Um, people are. Seems, no, people are. It's cool. I, it, I, it seems to me that... I, I, uh, hang on, Jim. Hang on, Jim. That, that, Go ahead. Uh, um, agnosticism is a perfectly respectable position, right? And uh, if, you, if you're... I mean, thinking about this back when I used to call myself an agnostic, um, it would it's going to be annoying to be told that you're classifying yourself wrongly right mm -hmm. so of course thank you sense. and by the way i am not against people that hold a strong atheism i do i get it i totally understand it matter of fact 
if we if we actually talked about other things relating to like the woo woo and and quantum woo woo and spiritualism nonsense and fortune telling and and homeopathy and all that crap, we are all on the same page, right? The only difference is is that I don't feel justified at this time in life to say I hold that belief. I'm a doxastic and voluntarist, so I, I I can't just will myself to believe something, and I don't hold to the belief that there are no gods. So I don't describe myself to the label of atheist. Now that may change from now, right? And I think atheists shoot themselves in the foot by not allowing that middle ground by saying it doesn't exist, which I think is completely wrong. Because as as you, Doctor Opie, you it seems like you went from different positions and you were agnostic and you have that position to go to, and then you've over over time reached a more strong uh, atheist position, right? So partly it was just I think that I my understanding of the labels changed, but there has in certain respects it's also true that my beliefs have I don't know they've clarified or hardened or something like that. So now these days I'm definitely a uh, pretty hardcore naturalist. Mm -hmm. But 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 so but the not the agnostic position is not some mediocre position. It has its own burden. No. Right? It has its own reasons. Um, it, there is a middle ground between belief and belief that it's not you know believing that the god are gods or, or believing that there are no gods. So when people just try to assume it under atheism, do you have any words for them? Because again, I've been fighting this battle for a long time. Oz has okay. been fighting this battle with me. Doctor Malpass is all, you know he agrees and disagrees because he's if you know Alex as as well as most people, Alex doesn't really like take positions. He's so brilliant that he's just here's it is you decide kind of thing. So. Um, I think for lots of professional philosophers, they're agnostic about lots and lots and lots of things. And so they're bound to think that agnosticism is a respectable position. If you think about all the philosophical questions, how hard they are, how hard it is to get your head around them and to take a position on them, it's inevitable that most professional philosophers are agnostic about lots of things. So you should, get, you should get lots of sympathy from all of them. And, and and this is why I put this on my Facebook. I know I got some criticism for it, but I did put on my Facebook, and this was not being smug. What it was was I had put out that many philosophers and people with PhDs, educated people, none of them, not one of them so far that I can think of, has ca uh, excoriated me or chastised me for my positions or said that I'm wrong. Matter of fact, even the logic I used, a friend of mine works at Cal State Long Beach. He's the head of the entire mathematical logic department, Dr. Uh, Bill Zemer. Um, I've known his wife since high school. Um, he loves what I write, and he thinks it's it's fine. Now, again, I may not have the formal training, but he goes by the concepts. And my my thing that I put on my Facebook was the people that are telling me I'm wrong. I did put like a gardeners and 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 rap DJs and people that I uh, real life scenarios of people that have tell me I'm wrong. And it wasn't a dismissing their occupation. I was in retail for 20 years for you know for Pete's sake, right? Nothing against person's occupation. My point was all those people had never read a philosophical paper. Not one of them have opened a book on the topic. Not one of them went to Google Scholar. Not one of them went to Google Books. And that to me is no different than saying I'm wrong about the shape of the earth or I'm wrong about the Big Bang or I'm wrong about evolution. Why is it any different if somebody would, if I would have changed this discussion to evolution and say, look at these six people, you know, they'd never opened a book on evolution. You know, they're DJs and whatever, but they're telling me I'm wrong that creationism is true. Yet all these biologists that I know with PhDs say that I'm, I'm right on it. Why is it any different if I use the same analogy in this case, talking about philosophy? It's not. They think it is. They, they. I, no, I, a lot of people get it, upset by my post on that. It's I, appeal I, I, to I, authority, Steve. But it's a legit. Well, no, it, no, no, it, no. It's it's an appeal to knowledge, is what it is. I mean, uh, and, I think I that's mean, probably a bad way of putting it too. It, it's a, it's a legit appeal to authority. Well, if I, was using I mean. It, Expansively, but they think that I was saying that because these people agree with me that I'm right, that would be fallacious, right? If I say yeah. Dr. Opie, who I have the utmost respect for, if I say I'm right because he says I'm right, that's a fallacy, right? But if I say, uh, hey, he's agreeing with me, meaning that my arguments aren't completely foobar, right? It's not fucked beyond, beyond recognition, then I'm, I think I'm, I'm good standing. I'm on, I'm on solid ground, and that's, that's what I'm coming from. Because people will, uh, will take me and they're just by fiat Sam wrong because all they've listened to is things like the atheist experience and they've never heard this other side of the stuff. Uh, Dr. Oppie, uh, I, I, have a, I have a question. Um, first of all, I, I just want to, want to say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my early 30s. Um, I am a, I am a, a, a D convert. Uh, I am uh, an, an expat he's, he's, of he's Christianity, for so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for someone and I have their number and their name Lawrence <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, 
so uh, a lot of people my age who deconvert who weren't raised in atheism a lot of people's uh i guess can say were uh the the catalyst were uh one of the greats, whether it be Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins or somebody like that, that actually um, helped foster them into into their their uh, their acceptance of their disbelief. Um, so Dawkins has his his spectrum, uh, his spectrum scale, the spectrum of theistic probability on a scale of one to seven, in which he he proposes that there is no uh, agnosticism. Uh, that it is just a a blurred line between uh, ex facto atheism and ex facto theism. Well, what what would you what would you say to that? And what is your uh, your personal opinion on the uh, the the validity of the the, the, the spectrum? So it's a and bit odd. It's, it, it's organizing, yeah. So so it's a bit odd to have a scale from one to seven, I think, because <laughs> there's kind of one proposition here. <laughs> And Thank so you. if you think of belief as a sort of all or nothing thing, either you've got it or you don't, um, and then there's this possibility of suspension in between, you'd think the scale might have three spots on it. If you're going to go the way that lots of philosophers do and think in terms of credence as probabilities, then you're going to have a continuum all the way from 100% to 0%. Right. Um, so I do think that the scale's a little bit, Odd, but that's just a kind of quibbling with the details, right? There is, there's clearly, uh, if you, once we move away from the, the kind of all or nothing, there's just three positions to, it's actually more nuanced than that. There's going to be a kind of graded scale of some sort. And sure. uh, I'm so, I, 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 I would put myself on Dawkins scale at a seven, not at a six, but anyway. Sure. Well, yeah, and, and and I've always said that you know, of course, you know, certainty is is not certain. But I, I've always said that one and seven are as close to one hundred percent certainty as 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 you can humanly possibly get, uh, and 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 have a a very 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 strong conviction. Uh, one could say an, an unbreakable conviction. And I've always said that I am that rationally I'm a six, but emotionally I'm a seven. Uh, sure, because sure, you know, it, it raises the the back of my my hair on the neck, my neck kind of thing. By the way, thank you for the super chat, Doctor Zayas. Um, and by the way, yes, I do think I believe that you, if you jump off the Empire State Building, you will die. Because the super chat said, um, let me read it real quick. Uh, jumping off the State Empire State Building, do you believe it will kill you or not kill you? Or agnostic on the proposition, no parachute or other main man made trickery. And yeah, there's somebody I guess that did survive, but that doesn't mean that my it just means my belief was wrong. That it's not. I didn't say it's impossible, right? Beliefs can be wrong, and I actually wrote. Uh, my bl a blog, and I don't think Dr. Opie read it, but it was on principle of attribution and retraction, how beliefs can be wrong, but knowledge can't be. But but when you talk about certainty, that could, that opens up a whole different reality of what we're talking about when we're talking about Descartes' certainty or things like Cartesian certainty or brain in a vat and arguments against that, like Putnam's arguments using uh, linguistics and things like um, uh, epistemic closure. These are fascinating things, which I am halfway through a blog piece on it. But I think that by talking about certainty, you're automatically going in down a path that doesn't need to be going down. Because to be an atheist, even in the philosophical sense, requires no certainty, right? It requires conviction, obviously, and it requires the proposition to be true. Or it requires some degree conviction. of certainty, but not absolute certainty. Well, but what is some, I mean, you're just, you're just making a probabilistic argument, which I think all things I mean, are, yeah. are probabilistic in that way. Yeah. Would you agree, Dr. Opie, that an atheist, if they just, if, if probabilistically speaking, they add up all these different arguments. They say, look, because of the problem of evil, logical and evidential and divine hiddenness and all these different reasons, I think the case is it is more likely ontologically that there are no gods. Therefore, I do believe that there are no gods. Um, that's a fine justification for me, for somebody to do that, is it not? Right. So um, I'm one way of thinking about this graded scale the agnostic would sit at 50%, right? It's that's, yeah, that's impossible. Right. Um, <laughs> and then anything between be a baby. 50 and 100 would be, oh, we'll, we'll do it in terms of there being no gods. That would be atheism all the way from certainty to just slightly more likely than not. All of those would count as atheism. Yeah, doc, well, Dr. Malbass has a little uh, preamble. He, he'll go, you know, a little bit on the side. So it's 50, a little bit higher, a little bit lower. I think there's a little yeah. bit of a range yeah. there. I'm, no, I'm not a black and white person. I, I'm a big fan of fuzzy logic for that reason. Yeah. yeah. See, and, 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 I, and I'm I'm of the position that if you're 50%, you're a baby. You have you have no knowledge one way or the other. If you're 51, you're, you're a theist. Do you and if you're 49... 
I, I, I really do got to ask. These are all belief things. Just, just, just so you know, he because, uh, because Jim, knowledge plays into your belief. What, what, Lawrence? Oh, uh, just so you know, uh, Jim was inadvertently calling you a baby. Oh, I guess. No, it was not. <laughs> no, I, 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 I heard it too. I called him a rock earlier, and he yeah. didn't even catch it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are, look, there are some days I he wake is up. It's not a and, Muslim country. It, 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 there are some days I wake up and I might side a little bit more toward an atheistic viewpoint, and some days I might wake up and be more atheistic. It all depends. I mean, people know we're going to have a hangout on DMT coming up here, and I'm doing a lot of research you, on, on that. And and you, let, wait, let me finish. I've had weird experiences, right? Um, and granted, I do think they're internalized. I think that uh, a neural theological constructivist approach is probably the way to go, rather than some kind of literal. But or a reduction of his approach or constructive. They're actually both of them would hold that, that these entities don't exist, but we've all had experiences. Now I'm not so willing to go so far that I'm a philosophical naturalist, but I can understand why people will be right. But again, I'm not at that position. Uh, that's why I do hold agnosticism. I think it's completely rational to do so. And when I hear people that are out there saying, well, that means you have to be 50% one way or another. No, I, I don't. There are times where I go back and forth and I vacillate. Um, Dr. Opie, is that, is that a ra again, I want my beliefs to be rational. Has everything you've said, or I've said so far in this hangout, um, does it appear to be rational or am I being completely irrational or even partially irrational? Um, be, be blunt. I begin. I, so, I'm okay, with it. I, okay, sure. But let's, let's go back and think a bit about what rationality requires. Um, some people set very high standards for being rational. Um, and other people have quite permissive standards. I, my standards are about as permissive as they can be. So almost everything gets to count as rational. Looking like a by, true philosopher. <laughs> by, by, by my lights. I mean, there are things you can't yeah. do. Like, I, I mean, some philosophers will think that um, you could you can believe absurd things and still be rational. I don't think Yeah, that. I, I don't fall for that. But, but, yeah. but, I mean, but there, my... there's not much by way of limits here. So long as, right? I mean, there's a kind of ordinary notion of rationality. On which most people. Well, how about this? And that's, the, that's the relevant standard that I want to appeal to. No, I agree with you, and I think that I think that's I uh, thank you for that. But how about consistency, or, or even better, am I consistent with with the modern understanding of most of these these readings of the of papers? And again, I'm not talking about outliers. I'm not talking about opinion pieces. Yeah, sure. But in general, um, am I am I being consistent in how so, these are used? In so, so, so I think that the way that you're thinking about um, the kind of topics that we've talked about today is consistent with what you find in things like the Stanford Encyclopedia, um, standard textbooks of philosophy of religion and so on. That's um, my biggest concern because I, I'm not, I'm not formally trained in any of this. Um, again, I've never taken a philosophy course other than critical thinking in contemporary rhetoric where I learned fallacies. So the one thing I did take in college was fallacies. So I did have a formal education on that. But other than that, I took no, no philosophy courses. And I regret that to this day because I used to be that person, Dr. Opie, that hated philosophy. I was one of those people that said, oh, philosophy is useless. It's a bunch of people sitting around in stuffed chairs, drinking cognac and smoking cigars. I had no idea how much value philosophy had until I had a friend of mine who had a PhD in philosophy who had run circles around my ass and I got tired of it. And getting involved in these conversations, I realized maybe I should learn this. And I'm so grateful that I have because I'm, I, I will tell everybody the whole thing about philosophy is about reasoning and is about logic and it is about trying to be rational and consistent. And it just is amazing some of the things you can think about that you cannot do from a scientific aspect. You have to, to bring it to the realm of, of metaphysics um, philosophy. You, you, you talk about consistency and, uh, and, and rationality and reason, um, but what other belief, philosophical or not, do you hold with the exception of the the deity or or not hold or or, or is or are agnostic about uh like say uh let's take naturalism for instance um is there anything else besides the the uh the possible uh existence of a deity that that you don't apply your naturalist side to or or, or naturalist well, again, uh, I, I only hold to methodological naturalism and by the way dr Gregory, uh, Opie, how, much, how much longer do you have i, 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 I should so probably much... get going fairly yeah. soon I think. Uh, yeah i kind of i kind of assume so so let me just wrap this up yeah, with yeah, this yeah, question sure thing in the after show well i, I, I want to get in this video because you asked me in this video so real quick um 
in science, you have to assume that there are natural explanations to, na to natural phenomenon. And science starts off with the, the methodology that there are no supernatural causations. And I think you have to hold to that. I'm perfectly fine right. with that. And I don't, ex I don't know of any supernatural causations for anything. And even if there was, would that mean ontologically that that becomes natural? Um, and again, I take a deity uh, to me, something that can prescriptively change the laws of the universe. Now, again, that's just stipulative, just for me. But anyways, Dr. Opie, uh, yeah, very much, thank you so much for joining us on this. Um, um, I'm glad that I have you on Twitter now. Um, hopefully that you can read some of my tweets and, and chime in. I mean, I, like I said, I am going to have Sisyphus Redeemed on to have a very similar thing about this. Maybe you can listen in and get your feedback. But can, overall, is there anything you want to tell the people um, about far as what we've talked about, your book, Atheism and Agnosticism, which, again, it was a very great read. Um, I'm still sussing out some of the agnostic stuff that you talked about, but I think I'm in agreement with you. But um, we'll, we'll let you kind of take us out, and then I might have an after show on this. Uh, nothing, nothing really in particular to add. But if you did like um, atheism and ag agnosticism, you should have a look at atheism: the basics. I enjoyed writing that book. Yeah, I mean, in fact, that's, somebody just asked me that question. They said, uh, uh, "What evidence moved you to accept atheism?" And I said, "There's a book on it, and uh, that, that 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 book is the one that, that you have some ev you have strong reasons to have support strong atheism, yeah. or reasons why people can have an, an atheist argument and be justified for it." Because I think a lot of people are concerned. I don't want to take a belief position or a one that they quote have a burn of proof because everybody agrees positive has a burn of proof. I think again. Anybody in a conversation does, yep. but they don't want to take I, that upon them because they don't have the skills yet or the knowledge in order to justify it because they don't know the arguments. Would you say that your book would give them the ability to do that, to move them from this lack of belief to an actual belief position? Um, what is the, probably what is not the name all. of this book? Atheism, the basics. That's what okay. it's called. Um, prob probably not. No book's got magic powers, but it certainly will help. And that's, that's that's all it is too. I mean, these are all persuasive arguments. But anyways, um, I am going to end this tonight. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, I am going to have an after show. I know a lot of people still want to talk about this stuff and ask me questions. But Dr. Opie, thank you very much for the for your generous time. Um, I'm really kind of still um, a little bit uh, starstruck because people of your caliber and people of your education, I'm in awe of because I know how difficult it is to learn even the basics on this particular topic of philosophy, because philosophy is freaking hard. I went through Naval Nuclear Power School and it wasn't as difficult as learning philosophy. <laughs> same here. It's, an, it's, it's an absolute honor to be in the in the same panel as you, uh, Dr. Oppie. It was, uh, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me on. Thank you, guys. And uh, we'll, we'll see you in the afternoon in about 15 minutes. Good night.